Hello, I'm Dorothy Buellis from Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. I'll be lecturing on hypoxic ischemic injury in the neonate. This talk will initially describe the techniques of the neonatal neurosonographic evaluation of the brain, including Doppler techniques and the mastoid view. We'll then review the differences in preterm and term cranial anatomy. Finally, we'll discuss the pathophysiology of hypoxic ischemic injury of the preterm and the term infant. This will include intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular white matter injury, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. When evaluating the neonatal brain, it's important to not just review the brain via the anterior fontanelle. We classically will look via the coronal and sagittal planes via the anterior fontanelle at the cranial structures. However, we'll review different viewing techniques, including the posterior and mastoid fontanelle, and discuss how Doppler using middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery resistive indices can help to assess for hydrocephalus as well as loss of autoregulation. When looking via the anterior fontanelle, it's important to use the highest resolution transducers possible. With our improved technology, we can now even detect the optic radiations of the periatrial regions between 26 and 36 weeks gestation. Improved resolution allows us to better look at the deep gray matter. Here, the immature deep gray matter becomes more echogenic, earlier in gestation becomes more hypoechoic in later gestation. If there is increased echogenicity in the deep gray matter in a term infant, one may worry that there is indeed hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Higher frequency transducers, particularly the linear transducers, give us beautiful detail of the cortical gray matter, the white matter, as well as the ventricles. Higher frequency linear transducers also allow us to look at the subarachnoid space, meningeal spaces, as well as with color Doppler looking at the superior sagittal sinus. Here's a case of a 29-week gestation using the curved transducer. We can see the ventricles cavum septum pellucidum and corpus callosum quite well, and there does not appear to be any evidence of a germinal matrix hemorrhage. However, with the linear transducer, we do see improved resolution of the cuttlefalabic notch with evidence of a small germinal matrix bleed. Here is another infant using both the curved and linear transducers. We can see in both that there is indeed intraventricular blood filling and extending the ventricles. With the linear transducer, you can see somewhat better a blush in the periventricular white matter consistent with the periventricular um, area of infarction. Besides going via the anterior fontanelle, it's important to remember that there are several other supplemental windows that we can use to look at the brain. The advantages of using these different supplemental windows include the ability to use higher frequency transducers, which give us higher resolution and earlier detection of abnormalities. Via the posterior fontanelle, one can see the atrium and periatrial white matter better. Here we have with a curved array transducer via the interfontanelle questionable areas of lucency along the periatrial white matter. Going via the posterior fontanelle using a linear transducer, one can clearly confirm the fact that indeed there are regions of periventricular leukopalasia in the white matter. The posterior fontanelle 
allows us to visualize the occipital horn, chori plexus, and basal cisterns. In a study by Coria et al., they found that there was a greater accuracy in detecting intraventricular hemorrhage using the posterior fontanelle and was superior in distinguishing normal peritrigonal blush from true white matter necrosis. It also can be used to look at the posterior fossa. The transtemporal approach via the thin temporal bone allows us to look at the brain in an axial projection. This also allows us to see the third ventricle, frontal horns, and occipital horns quite well. Here we have an infant who had a posterior fossa bleed nicely demonstrated via the temporal window. The mastoid view is an important view that can demonstrate pathology in the posterior fossa, including the brainstem and cerebellum. This deeply obliged view allows us to angle in any direction we really want in the posterior aspect, and we can see the cerebellum in this plane, which looks like a bilobed structure. It's an axial plane, but in a steep projection. With the pastoid fontanelle, we see that there's improvement in visualization, not only of the cerebellum and midbrain, but also the cisterns. In a study by Luna et al., they showed that using the mastoid fontanelle improved visualization of the posterior fossa in virtually all cases, increased diagnostic confidence in 75% of cases, and more importantly, was the only technique to show abnormalities in the posterior fossa in 46% of cases. Here we can see the posterior fossa with blood clot obstructing the aqueduct with dilatation of the third ventricle and lateral ventricles. Here are several different examples of blood filling the fourth ventricle and causing hydrocephalus. The last technique we'll talk about before we get to the actual imaging of the neonatal brain is Doppler. We can look at the anterior cerebral artery via the sagittal midline view. With colored Doppler, we can see the anterior cerebral artery and then the pericostal artery as it courses along the cavum septum pellucidum. By putting the cursor on the anterior cerebral artery branches, we get a Doppler signal and um, we should look at the peak systolic velocity, end diastolic velocity, resistive index, and our pulsatility index. The middle cerebral artery can also be insinated. This can be obtained via the coronal plane. Both the right and left middle cerebral arteries can be insinated, and again, peak systolic and diastolic and resistive indice measurements can be obtained. Resistive index is a very important uh, value to obtain as we use Doppler work on the neonate because it minimizes the effect of angulation. The resistive index is peak systole minus end diastole divided by peak systole. There are age-dependent values available, and as you can see from what's listed here, that by age two, the normal value of 0.5 is met. It's important to remember that term infants, a resistive index of 0.7 is normal. And in preterms, it's actually slightly higher with a mean of 0.77. An increase in diastolic flow will result in a decrease in resistive index. You will get this type of waveform pattern, which looks somewhat venous, with very high flow in diastole. With a decrease in diastolic flow, you get an increase in resistive index. And here you see a very pulsatile waveform. As intracranial pressure increases above mean arterial pressure, diastolic flow may actually become reversed. The resistive indexes will be greater than one, and you can see that the diastolic flow is below baseline. We'll now start looking at actually the brain. 
there is quite a lot of maturation that occurs from 24 weeks to 36 weeks gestation. There's gyration, myelination, glial cell migration, decrease in water content. These images of the fetus demonstrate how smooth the cortex is at 20 weeks. And you begin to start getting infolding of the sylvian fissures by about 20 weeks gestation. As the infant matures, by 36 weeks, you have a fairly more mature pattern with multiple sulci and gyri. And the corpus callosum, nicely demonstrated here, is seen on top of a cavum septum pellucidum with the cavum vergi getting smaller in size. The germinal matrix is the origin of neuronal glial development. There are rich arterial perforators from the ACA, MCA, and PCA, and these will drain to the deep venous system. The germinal matrix is present in the fetus and starts to regress from posterior to anterior between the 24th and 28th week gestation. Typically, by 32 weeks, the entire germinal matrix has involuted. Because of the vascularity to this area with poor support structure and thin vessel walls, this is a very vulnerable area for hemorrhage. It is the most common origin of hemorrhages in the preterm infant, with up to 20% of preterm infants developing a germinal matrix hemorrhage. Infants less than 1,500 grams are also quite vulnerable in getting germinal matrix bleeds and it's felt that these bleeds are, are venous in origin. The caudothalamic notch, where the last part of the germinal matrix resides, has a very poor stromal support. And the vessels here converge to form the draining veins. The theory is that with increased flow, venous um, rupture occurs at these convergence points, and that's why it's so common to see hemorrhages in this region. With hemorrhage, oxygen delivery is reduced, and there's typically a switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism with an increase in lactate formation. This can also cause secondary injury to the brain. In addition, as the blood ruptures into the ventricle, you get hemorrhage blocking CSF absorption, ending up um, causing a ventriculitis with hydrocephalus developing. It's important to remember Papil's classification as this is useful in assessing long-term outcome. Grade one hemorrhages are simply isolated subependable hemorrhages that do not extend into the ventricle. Grade twos, there's enough blood that ruptures into the ventricles, but ventricular dilatation does not occur acutely. With grade threes, there's so much hemorrhage that occurs into the ventricles that ventricular dilatation um, occurs with filling of blood. Grade four, which we now call periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, are hemorrhages in the parenchyma that are associated with a germinal matrix bleed. Some people use a modified classification of the papill system, particularly if you do not follow the um, head ultrasounds closely and systematically. Thus, if you see blood isolated in the subependable hemorrhage, you will just label that a subependable hemorrhage. If there is blood in the ventricle, you call it an intraventricular hemorrhage, and then just add with or without hydrocephalus. Once there is a periventricular hemorrhagic infarct associated with it, you will describe it as a germinal matrix bleed with a periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. Here are some examples. This is a subependymal hemorrhage isolated to the germinal matrix. It has not extended into the ventricle and there's no ventricular dilatation. The sagittal view is particularly helpful in identifying the caudothalamic notch. So here's the thalamus, here's the caudate, here's the notch, and here's a little bit of blood. Remember that the choroid does not extend anterior to caudothalamic notch, 
So once you identify echogenic material anterior to this level, indeed there is an intraventricular hemorrhage. Here we have echogenic blood at the caudal notch that's extending somewhat anterior to that caudal notch consistent with intraventricular hemorrhage but without hydrocephalus. Here we have a 28-week gestation where you see that there's blood extending anterior to the cotophthalmic notch. So we have blood in the ventricle with mild dilatation of the ventricle and blood also in the back of the occipital horn. Once you have ventricular megaly with the blood, this can be called germinal matrix bleed with ventricular megaly or grade threes. And here we see nicely blood filling the cotophthalmic notch, filling the ventricles and causing ventricular dilatation. Here's another case where you have ventricular dilatation, blood filling the ventricles, and this again is a grade three. Often, you'll see blood filling the ventricles and the third ventricle here when the bleed initially occurs. It's very important in these cases to do follow-up ultrasounds as increasing ventricular megaly will occur. Within a week, in this case, you can see that there is marked dilatation of the lateral and third ventricles with increased extradicity along the walls consistent with ventriculitis. With periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, typically you can see a germinal matrix bleed. It may extend into the ventricle, and then associated with it, you'll start seeing a area of increased estrogenicity within the periventricular white matter. These are typically asymmetric, and um, if they are bilateral, they usually have one side larger than the other. With these periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, you find them classically in the periventricular white matter in the dorsal lateral aspect of the lateral ventricle where the medullary veins are confluent. Here we have blood filling the ventricle. It's quite difficult actually to see where the ventricle ends and the white matter necrosis occurs. And here we have a large periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. And with time, this blood clot will break down. You'll start seeing the area of poor encephaly. With intraventricular hemorrhages and periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, it's very common for hydrocephalus to develop several days to weeks later. As the ventricles dilate, it's useful to know whether there is increased intracranial pressure. The neonatologists rely on this information to know how often they need to tap the infant and whether a drain needs to be placed. If the ventricles are dilated simply because of atrophy, tapping or drain is not necessary. So how do you differentiate between hydrocephalus and ventricular megaly? This is where Doppler can help. When there is increased intracranial pressure, there is decreased perfusion during diastole, and you result with this very pulsatile wave pattern with very little flow during diastole. In this case, there was no flow. So this resistive index is elevated and it's gonna measure only one. So with go and all, we saw that if there is an increase in resistive index, this is indeed a sign of an increase in intracranial pressure. And as mentioned, in the neonate, Typically, in a premature infant, the resistive index should measure about 0.77, and anything greater than 0.8 to 0.9 should be considered increased and consistent with increased intracranial pressure. Dr. Taylor demonstrated that if you put some pressure on the interfontanelle and demonstrate increasing um, resistive indices during this maneuver, this also is a sign that the infant does have hydrocephalus. Post-tapping an infant with increasing intracranial pressure with elevated resistive indices, 
the pressure diminishes and you start seeing improvement in diastolic flow. If this continues in a cycle to wait a few days, see elevated resistive indices tap, see normalization of resistive indices, eventually this should start stabilizing and tapping can be decreased in number. If, however, there's no change in the resistive index after tapping, it suggests that there may need a shunt. As I mentioned, the classification grade one through grade four is useful in assessing for outcome. Notice that infants who have a normal ultrasound, and these are in premature infants, while the ultrasound may be normal, still about 10% of premature infants in this subgroup will have abnormal neurologic outcome. And this is true for infants who have grade one hemorrhages. Those infants with grade two hemorrhages have about um, an 85% chance of doing well neurologically. And the slightly higher risk of abnormalities is due to the possible requirement of a shunt. With grade threes, the outcome is worse. There is now up to an 8% mortality and 30 to 50% abnormal neurologic outcome. When there's a periventricular hemorrhagic infarct, the outcome is quite dramatically worse. There's up to 60% mortality. Almost all these infants will have a major motor deficit and over 60% will have decreased cognitive function. Why is this outcome so poor? Well, with hydrocephalus, um, you may get some injury due to the ventricular dilatation, or if they're dependent on a shunt, you may get shunt-related complications from infections, obstruction, seizures. But in addition, there is hypoxic ischemic injury to the white matter with gliosis and axonal swelling. And this is what results in your spastic hemiparesis and cognitive de deficits. Now, a question to be raised is which of the following is the current leading cause of neurologic cognitive deficits in preterm infants? And in the past, people would have said intraventricular hemorrhage. But nowadays, it's actually diffuse, non-cystic white matter injury. So white matter injury, previously called periventricular leukomalacia, had a quite a high prevalence, up to 25%. Nowadays, the report is as low as 7%. Yet we have noticed that premature infants that survive, particularly very low birth weight preterms, have an increased incidence of cerebral palsy. The question then is raised, are we truly accurate, accurately identifying white matter injury by ultrasound? We know there is a changing understanding of perinatal white matter injury. We no longer think this is purely from ischemia or hypoxia, and there may be maternal and fetal factors as well, even before the baby is born. We know that ischemic pre-oligodendrocytes are quite susceptible to reactive oxygen species, glutamine, cytokines, and adenosine. As these glial cells differentiate to ostracize and oligodendric glia, there is active myelination occurring. There is a lot of metabolic activity with high oxygen demands, and these are quite vulnerable to hypoxia. And that's why in premature infants, the periventricular white matter is the most vulnerable to injury. By ultrasound, we may not recognize these areas of injury well because they're deep in the white matter and they tend to be symmetric. Anisotropic effects of the periventricular halo can um, mimic an injury so we can have both false positive and false negative readings. An area that may look echogenic may actually be normal, or an area that we think is normal may actually be true white matter injury. In addition, the timing of the exam is also critical because initially you may have some subtle areas of increased echogenicity, but within a few days that echogenicity may resolve and the ultrasound may look completely normal and only after 10 to 14 days may cystic encephalomalacia develop. So if you do the ultrasounds too early or too late, you may miss some of these findings.
So acutely, you might see patchy areas of increased exogenicity, but in the subacute stage, you may actually have a fairly normal looking ultrasound. And in only some of these patients does cystic cavitation occur. So initially, you might see these patchy areas of increased exogenicity. If this is not well seen, it's important to do follow-up exams two to three weeks after the initial event to see whether cystic encephalomasia occurs. So thus, it's quite important to use the highest frequency transducers possible to be aware that indeed these are true white matter areas of necrosis. And on follow-up, you may end up seeing these areas of cystic encephalomalacia. Here we have an infant with focal areas of increased exogenicity. On higher resolution, you can see that in fact these are scattered with multiple areas of periventricular leukomalacia. Here again with a curved, it's hard to see whether there's cystic encephalomalacia in these areas of increased exogenicity. With the linear transducer, this confirms the fact that indeed these are areas of white matter necrosis that have broken down. With our improved resolution, higher resolution transducers, we can actually see smaller infarcts that have been confirmed by MRI. Here we can see focal areas of infarction in the caudate, secondary to infarctions of the ACA. Here we see increased estrogenicity in the thalamus and basal ganglia, which are secondary to infarctions of the lenticulous striate vessels. It's important to remember in term infants with asphyxia, the injuries are not in the periventricular white matter. They're more vulnerable in the cortex and in the thalamus. So here we have to look very carefully for areas of increased exogenicity, loss of architecture, and asymmetry. Here in this term infant, you look carefully for border zone cortical regions of increased exogenicity. Many infants in the newborn period have slit-like ventricles and look somewhat echogenic, being delivered vaginally or by C-section. Looking at the thalami for increased exogenicity may suggest that this is an infant who has significant hypoxic ischemic cephalopathy. On follow-up, one sees that the patchy areas of increased exogenicity are indeed real, and this child did have severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Another way to help prove that a term infant has been asphyxiated is to use Doppler. Typically, after asphyxia, you lose cerebral autoregulation. You get vasodilatation with increase in flow in diastole. This low recessive index is typically seen in the first 48 hours of asphyxia, and this strongly correlates with poor neurologic outcome. So here we have a term infant, looks somewhat echogenic, is this truly an asphyxiated infant? When we use Doppler, this is via the anterior cerebral artery, the resistive index is quite low, measuring 0.5. And on follow-up, the hypoxic ischemic injury was confirmed. Here's another term infant. Is this normal or is it edematous? With Doppler, we can see the resistive index was quite low, less than 0.5. And on follow-up MRI, we see not only injury to the thalami and basal ganglia, but to the cortex as well. We can also use Doppler to look for non-hemorrhagic infarctions. These are fairly rare and typically found in term infants. They may present with seizures. The etiology of these focal infarcts is not clear. At times, emboli, heart disease, meningitis have come into play.
here we have an infant who had suggestion of increased actinicity in the right hemisphere. There was decreased uh, resistive indices with increased diastolic flow on the right, and it was confirmed by CT that this was a right MCA infarct. Here's another infant. There's an appearance of slight increased actinicity in the left hemisphere. Normal flow was seen in the right MCA, and no flow was seen in the left MCA. And by C, MCA infarct was confirmed. Now here we have a premature infant. Via the anterior fontanelle, we see a focal area of periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. So you might think that our job is done. Notice that the cerebellum looks quite normal here. However, on the mastoid view, we identify a focal cerebellar hemorrhagic infarct as well. It turns out that cerebellar hemorrhagic infarcts are, do occur both in extreme low weight preterm infants as well as term infants, particularly those on ECMO. There is a quite high incidence of cerebellar hemorrhagic infarcts in the extreme low birth weight preterm infants, and their outcome is significantly affected by this finding. Thus, because the posterior fossa hemorrhages are underrecognized, it becomes quite useful to perform mastoid views routinely to look for posterior fossa lesions. So here we have an infant. The cerebellum looks relatively normal here. We're losing the fourth ventricle and brain stem, but on the mastoid view, we clearly see a focal area of hypoecogenicity, um, and on CT, this was confirmed to be a posterior fossa hemorrhage. Here's another infant where you have a heterogeneous posterior fossa. There's actually areas of low as well as increased exogenicity. And on CT again, confirmation of the posterior fossa bleed. One last case, again on coronal imaging via the anterior fontanelle, the posterior fossa looked normal. Yet on the mastoid view, we see an area of heterogeneity within the cerebellum confirmed by CT with bilateral infarcts of both cerebellar hemispheres. So in conclusion, neurosynology is an integral part of the care of the neonate. There are numerous hypoxic injuries that can be seen, and these do vary with gestational age. Ultrasound is extremely helpful in the assessment of hemorrhages within the germinal matrix and in the ventricle. It is less sensitive for the identification of white matter necrosis, infarcts, and the posterior fossa. However, with the use of high-resolution transducers, supplemental views, and Doppler, these more subtle anomalies can be identified. Thank you.